I've often referred to in private conversation to Gendi Tartakovsky as the Guillermo del Toro of animation. To me, he's not only the greatest animation creator of this generation, but the only one who produces animation for television that I am very comfortable referring to his work as art. I am a fan of 90% of the projects that he's either created or worked on. Samurai Jack, as you may have guessed, is one of my all-time favorite shows. I tell you this so you understand the gravity of my words when I tell you that Unicorn Warriors Eternal is my favorite thing to ever have his name attached to it. And I've only seen 10 episodes. Now, for starters, in the world of animation, there's these unspoken rules that apply only to animated shows as opposed to live action shows. Um, rules like the premise has to be simple. Simple enough for kids to understand it, but complex enough to keep um, adult uh, older audience members interested. The pacing has to be fast and you just have to get, you know, all your stuff in tell, tell a full story between 11 to 22 minutes and move on just as quickly as possible. By the end of the episode, everything goes back to the status quo. Just a lot of these unspoken rules, again, that don't necessarily apply to live action shows. This show breaks almost every rule that is set for North American televised animation. We've already seen a few of these rules broken um, for all these wonderful animated streaming shows that we're enjoying these days. You know, streaming is the new frontier. In my Disney Afternoon videos, I talk about how when I was a kid, cable was the new frontier. It was the Wild West. They were allowing a lot of things that weren't allowed on, on network television. Now, streaming has become that. And now it's getting to the point that because um, animation has evolved to such a degree on streaming, cable has to keep up. Cable has to step up and live up to that new standard. And to me, that's what this show represents. It represents um, the evolution, evolution of television, of televised animation. This show has a premise that is very intricate that I'm going to try to explain to you if you haven't seen the show yet uh, in a few minutes uh, and I'm not going to fully do it justice. I, I am going to tell you right here and now, I've seen 10 episodes of this show. I've seen the entirety of season one. It's approximately, if you watch it, if you binge it, it's approximately four hours long. I've seen four, approximately four hours of Unicorn Warriors Eternal, and I still feel like I've only seen the tip of the iceberg. That's how intricate and elaborate this show is. Like I said, animation has to keep like a quick or steady pace, you know, just keep the audiences interested. This show takes its sweet time. It's a slow burn, a fascinating, entertaining slow burn, but it takes its time, unlike most animated shows. This show is serialized, which fits in perfectly with this era of streaming shows where almost every streaming series is serialized. It's not episodic. Uh, there are very few streaming shows that have standalone episodes or oneers, as some people like to call them, where the story is self-contained in just that one episode. They all tend to be one big season-long story. Each episode continues on to the next. And yes, Unicorn Warriors most definitely fits into this model of 
entertainment that we are enjoying now. Um, and often, when people talk about these shows, especially the ones that are released one episode per week, uh, which personally I think is a great model and it keeps you interested in the show, it gives you time to digest each episode as opposed to just binging it, binging it all at once and then it's just gone. In this era, I constantly hear people say stuff like, um, oh my god, I need the next episode now. Oh my god, this, that's not enough, you know. 30 minutes, 40 minutes is not enough. And often I roll my eyes at those people. Because I love a good cliffhanger and I love to have those seven days for me to process what I saw and build up the expectation to the next episode. Unicorn Warriors Eternal is the first show that I've seen since I was a kid where I see one 22 minute episode and it just wasn't enough. I just, I needed the next episode right away. It just created that sense of urgency. Each episode just has a wonderful cliffhanger at the end of it and I respected the hell out of it because it effectively wanted me, made me w want it, want the next episode immediately. So, the pacing and the story work in a much different way than your standard animated show. This show is very bold in that sense, and I respect the hell out of it because it effectively keeps you watching through all 10 episodes. There's no forgetting that Unicorn Warriors Eternal is about to come on. Like, you remember, like, you cannot wait to see what's going to happen next. And I applaud the creators for that. Now, I'm going to do my absolute best to explain the premise of this show to you um, in the most simple and concise way that I can think of. And um, here I go. So basically... There's this ambiguous evil, this evil entity that um, is going to destroy the whole of reality. What is it? Um, um, what, is, what is its intent? We don't know. All we know is that it's bad and it's going to destroy everything. Everything that was, is, or ever will be. Merlin, the wizard from the Arturian lore, uh, assembles a team of warriors, the unicorn warriors, to fight this evil. However, they are mortal. So every time that they die fighting this evil that is eternal and ongoing, their souls are absorbed into this um, talisman with the, a picture of a unicorn on it that is kept safe inside of a robot named Copernicus. And every generation, Copernicus seeks out, seeks out three worthy people and he gives the souls of the warriors to these three individuals and those three individuals become the warriors um, and they continue the fight until they die again and then, and then the, the, the cycle begins anew. The show takes place in 1890 London during the industrial era and Copernicus, is, the Copernicus, the robot, is woken up from his slumber a little too early by a minion of the evil. Now, now it suddenly has minions. The minion is called Junwei. She is a kitsune. She is a creature of Japanese lore. Basically, a kitsune is like this uh, fox with paranormal, supernatural abilities, and they're generally identified by having nine tails. Anyway, so Junwei wakes up Cop Copernicus too early and he does what he's programmed to do. He seeks out three worthy people. Unfortunately, the people that he finds to take on the souls of the three warriors are too young and something goes wrong and one of them, Melinda, um, still has the memories and personality of the person whose body she took over, Emma. So there's this um, issue that Every, before that, before every time the souls took over the people, they would just go on and they would be fine. They would just take over their bodies. But now Emma remembers who she is and now she has these powers that she can't control and this responsibility that she doesn't want to undertake. So she is the most reluctant hero that you'll ever see. Like she doesn't want this. All she wants to do is get married 
and just have a a very mundane uh, life of a housewife. And she is cool with that. That's what she wants. Um, she doesn't want to be a warrior. She doesn't want to fight this evil. She doesn't want to save the world. Doesn't care about any of this. The progression of that character alone makes the show worth watching. The Emma at the beginning of the show and the Emma at the end of the show, completely different characters. Um, beautifully played uh, by an actor that I've never heard of before um, called Hazel Dupe. Um, and here's another interesting fact about the show. Because it takes place um, in London in 1890, most of it takes place in London in 1890, uh, the characters that obviously are British. Um, and instead of casting um, local Hollywood actors, uh, voice actors, as the characters doing, you know, the, the best British accents they could possibly do, they actually casted British actors. And most of which recorded uh, their, their voiceover remotely. They recorded it in um, England or in that vicinity. And... Um, and they would communicate with um, the, the um, voice directors via Zoom call. Um, very much like David Tennant recorded his lines for um, the Nickelodeon Ninja Turtles and uh, DuckTales reboot. So it helps with the authenticity. They sound legitimately like they are from where they claim to be. Um, and yes, it's a lot of newcomers, a lot of people that don't do voiceover regularly, but these actors are amazing and I cannot compliment them enough. Like I said, um, Hazel Dupe, who is the de facto main character, an amazing lead. She carries the show very, very well. Uh, she's both the main character and the audience surrogate. And she is, through her, you are experiencing the world of Unicorn Warriors Eternal. She's accompanied in her adventures by this uh, celestial monk who has taken on the body of, the, of this little orphan boy and a uh, warrior elf who's taken on the body of the street magician. Um, the, the warrior elf, Idrid, is played by Tom Milligan, again, another fantastic British actor. The young monk is played by a 100% newcomer called Damari Hunt. Uh, this is his first credit, first TV or film credit at all. I'm sure that the young man has done uh, some theater um, acting or some kind of acting before because he is very talented. Like, he was made for this. He is so ridiculously good. I was blown away that this is his first uh, TV and or film credit. Um, very likable, very charismatic, uh, perfectly embodies of this character that is this uh, delightfully oblivious young celestial monk who cannot handle his powers. Um, so a big part, a big chunk of this season is just discovery. They are moving along as they are figuring out like what their mission is, who they are, uh, how they're going to beat the evil, and it keeps escalating and escalating. They pick up characters along the way. Eventually, they find Merlin. He joins the cast, uh, the party, I should say, uh, played by uh, Jeremy Crotchley, fantastic actor who um, was in, he was in Primal before this. Again, these last show, um, in the episode that takes place in uh, Victorian London. Um, Victorian England, I should say. Um, fantastic, wonderful to have him back. Um, and they also pick up, <laughs> I don't want to give it away, but they pick up a werewolf, uh, played by, uh, George Webster. Um, I, I don't want to give it away, but I was originally not crazy about his character, but halfway through the season, um, especially when he's accepted onto the group. Uh, I just fell in love with him just. He is just this wonderful contradiction where he is this sweet, docile, civilized gentleman. Um, just a complete pussycat, but who's a beast. He is a monster. <laughs> um, 
and just played beautifully uh, by George. George did a terrific job, another incredible British actor, uh, not a uh, um, somebody who has a concentration in voiceover, but that did a fantastic job. So, and I keep pointing this out um, because I, I'm often accused of, you know, being a gatekeeper when it comes to voiceover and that only experienced voice actors should do it. No. What I'm gate if I if I am gatekeeping and I don't mean to be, I'm gatekeeping against celebrities that don't have the talent to do it. On camera talent that are chosen, that are given voiceover roles without auditioning because they're famous to hype up the product, to help promote it, okay? But if you have the talent, like the amazing cast of the show, by all means, come on in, do it, get behind the mic, play the character. If you have the talent, if you auditioned, if you have the ability to put your entire performance into your voice, then I applaud you, I respect you, and I welcome you in as a fan to the world of animation. By all means, bring it on. Um... So, yeah, this show is just a love letter to animation you, with its premise and its uh, very serious tone. Um, you'd figure that, it, you know, one of the many rules that they break is that, you know, the look of the show should fit its tone. And this show completely revokes that, completely turns its back on that. The characters have a very light look to them. They have a very classic um, 1930s, 1940s animation aesthetic, you know, very Popeye, very Betty Boop to it, very, very Betty Boop look to it, Fleischer Studios look to it. Um, and just lots of little homages to that era of animation. This is an animated show made by people that are clearly animation fans for animation fans. Um, so much so, and it always, it, it, it burns my freaking balls that so many people look down on animation and they don't hold it up in the same reverence or with the same level of respect as live action media and, and I always feel that if these individuals knew how much freaking work is required to create just a, a a few minutes of animation they would change their attitude very quickly there's nothing more disrespectful than um cartoon network squishing uh the credits of an animated show because all those people squishing the credits so they could advertise something during them. Um, because all those people contributed to amazing artistic work to the production of that show. Um, so I love that A, uh, Cartoon Network slash Adult Swim doesn't squash the credits, and B, that the creators were smart enough to make it so they don't, they can't squish the credits or shouldn't squish the credits by showing you storyboards and concept art from each episode during the credits, which is wonderful. So you're seeing the level of work that goes into it. I believe the first show that started doing this was one that was produced by, um, again, Dee Tartakovsky's good, good friend, Greg McCracken, uh, Wander Over Yonder. Wander Over Yonder, they would show you like animatics or deleted scenes or... Um, just storyboarded scenes um, that were not used in that particular episode. So you would get bonus content, but because they would show you a clip um, during the credits, they would stop the network from squashing it so, so they could show you coming up next or advertise Coke or whatever the freaking um, <laughs> uh, sponsor is. And I know sponsors are important, but are they important enough to disrespect the people that worked on the show and not show their credit on screen? No. Um, so, this season uh, focused a lot on Melinda and Idrid. We learned a lot about them throughout those 10 episodes. We didn't learn that much about Copernicus or Singh. So again, there's so much ground to cover. And again, in 
spoiler alert, the season ends in a massive cliffhanger that I can't wait for the next season. I, I need it as soon as possible. That's what this show has done to me. Gendy Tarakowski intended for this to be his second animated show. For this to be the very next show that he did after Dexter. He's been trying to get Unicorn Warriors Eternal made, or greenlit, I should say, for 20 years. Now, I can understand why networks would pass on this. Like I, I, I expressed at the top of this video, it's not your common show. It's hard to explain. It's hard to classify. It breaks a lot of the rules. Um, but to think that they, because it breaks those rules, these people were willing to pass on something that is extraordinary. Um, so, yeah, it sucks that so many were short-sighted, too short-sighted to see the potential of this show and give it a chance. But at the same time, I have to say, man, it was worth the wait. So, before I close this out, a couple of announcements. Um, number one, right now on my Patreon page, I did an e-rant on Superman and Lois Season 3. If you want to hear my unscripted, uncensored, unfiltered thoughts on that show, but you're not a patron, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash erod and pledge one dollar. That's it. One dollar and you get to help me continue to continue to create content and in return you get bonus videos. You can't beat that with a wooden stick. And also, I'm going to announce what my next honest review is going to be. A very obscure show called Cyber Six. If you've never heard about this show before, um, feel free to look it up, but if you want to go in fresh and find out what the show is all about from me, um, then you are in for a treat. It's one of my all-time favorite underrated shows. Anyway, thank you for watching. As per usual, I give you the same message at the end that I always give because it is 100% true. Um, thank you, because I couldn't do what I do without you.